Welcome to Clinical Minute. Ashley is a 25-year-old woman, G1P0, who is presenting with her long-term boyfriend for a routine gynecological exam. You greet her and ask her how she's been since her last visit. Before reviewing her record, you ask if she has any special concerns today. Without missing a beat, she says, I want to get my tubes tied. You are a bit taken aback hearing this from such a young woman with no children. How do you respond? You know that worldwide, more than 220 million couples use permanent contraception, also known as sterilization. In the United States, approximately 600,000 tubal occlusions and 200,000 vasectomies are performed annually. Almost half of married couples and almost one-third of cohabiting couples in the U.S. use sterilization as their method of contraception. Overall, permanent contraception is used by 23% of women ages 15 through 44 in the United States. You also know that sterilization has a troubled history in the U.S. Throughout the 20th century, there have been more than 60,000 documented cases of government-sponsored coerced sterilization. Through these programs, some of the most marginalized and vulnerable women, including low-income women, women of color, immigrant women, women with disabilities, and others deemed unfit to reproduce, were sterilized without their full knowledge and consent. You also know that some women who desire sterilization have been denied this option for a variety of reasons. These reasons include state regulations and restrictions on federally funded procedures, such as the required 30-day waiting period for Medicaid-funded sterilizations, as well as difficulty accessing or obtaining services at religiously affiliated institutions and hospitals. Also, in part due to the general cultural assumption that all women will desire childbearing at some point in the future, some providers are reluctant to sterilize younger, nulliparous women. In addition, some are concerned that their patients will experience decision regret. However, you know that it is possible for any patient to experience decision regret. This is true for many important life decisions, not just sterilization. Individuals often accept the risk of decision regret with other important life choices, such as whether and where to continue their education, whether to end a marriage, and whether to pursue a specific career. Yet, sometimes decisions about permanent contraception are seen in a different light, with the false expectation that it is possible to eliminate any chance that a decision will later be regretted. You remind yourself that decision regret is negatively correlated with the adequacy of pre-sterilization counseling, including an understanding that sterilization is permanent and that other reversible contraceptive options are available. In other words, the better the counseling and education, the less the chance of regret. While some women do later change their mind and wish they could have a child or additional children, most women who choose sterilization do not regret their decision. You are also reminded of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, committee opinion from July 2007, which states, Providers who perform sterilization have ethical responsibilities of the highest order to counsel patients fully and without bias. You are concerned that Ashley may later regret a decision to pursue permanent contraception. She's so young, and it can be hard to predict how she'll feel in five or ten years. However, you also recognize that this concern is based on your personal bias, and that you must set it aside and support her in making the decision that's right for her. You plan to go through the components of pre-sterilization counseling as recommended by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. The permanent nature of the procedure, not intended to be reversible. Alternative methods available, particularly long-acting reversible contraception and vasectomy. The details of the procedure, including risks and benefits of anesthesia. The possibility of failure including ectopic pregnancy, 
with sterilization and other methods. The need to use condoms for protection against sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. The need to use an alternative form of contraception after hysteroscopic sterilization until hysterosalpingogram confirms tubal occlusion. Completion of informed consent process. Local regulations regarding interval from time of consent to procedure. Effect of sterilization on future health insurance coverage. For example, non-contraceptive uses of hormonal contraceptives, reversal or infertility services. With all of this in mind, you tell Ashley that you'd be happy to discuss permanent contraception with her. You'd like to go ahead and take care of her exam first, and then she can get dressed and you can talk in your office. You ask her how that sounds, and she says, that sounds good. A review of her full health history confirms that it is completely normal. She is generally healthy and has no current complaints. Her physical exam is normal as well. You ask her to get dressed and meet you in your office, saying that you'd like to check in with her alone for just a minute before you invite her boyfriend in. When Ashley peeks her head into your office a few minutes later, you invite her to sit down. You tell her that it's your practice to always check in with the patient by herself before inviting in a partner, parent, or other support person. Using these principles for shared decision-making, you proceed to counsel Ashley. Query to identify preferences. Ask open-ended questions. Provide information about side effects, effectiveness, and use of method. Give context about options. Ensure access to method placement and removal. Allow time for questions. Ensure informed consent. Since she's already clearly stated her preference, you tell Ashley you'd like to hear more about her decision to get her tubes tied. You ask, so tell me, how did you come to this decision? She says that she's never wanted to have children. She also shares that if she did ever decide to have kids or was with someone who wanted to have kids, she would want to adopt since there are so many kids in the foster care system who need a home. She says she is tired of using other methods of birth control. You say that it's obvious she's given this decision a lot of thought. You go on to say, This is something that I ask all of my patients who are considering sterilization. How do you think you would handle it if you changed your mind down the line and decided you did want to have a baby? She responds confidently, I really can't see that happening, but we would adopt. You ask about her relationship with her boyfriend, and she shares that she and Marcus have been together for five years and have lived together for three. You further ask her how her boyfriend feels about the decision to pursue sterilization. She says that they have talked about it and agree 100%. You remark that Ashley seems very clear and certain about her decision. You ask Ashley if she'd like to invite Marcus in, which she does. You explain that, as part of talking with people who want to pursue sterilization, you like to go over all of the methods that are available so that they can choose the one that's best for them. You invite them to stop you if they have any questions. You say that sterilization is a permanent method of preventing pregnancy, but that it doesn't prevent against sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. You explain your options to them using diagrams to help with understanding. Tubal ligation, or having your tubes tied, is a method of female sterilization that involves blocking the fallopian tubes so the woman's eggs can't get to the uterus to meet up with sperm. Blocking the fallopian tubes can be done with clips, rings, or using an instrument to close the tubes by burning them. Tubal ligation is more than 99% effective. Tubal ligation can be performed on an outpatient basis, meaning that the patient can go home the same day. After the procedure, the incision usually heals in a couple of days, although a woman should take it easy for a week or two before resuming normal activity. 
Typically, a woman can resume sexual intercourse in about one week. No backup birth control is needed. Possible complications with tubal ligation include reactions to anesthesia and general surgical risks such as infection. This procedure can be performed at the time of a cesarean section through the same incision or at the same time as an abortion with a laparoscope. Tubal occlusion is a non-surgical female sterilization method. It involves the placement of a small device within each fallopian tube. The inserted device causes inflammation, which stimulates tissue growth that eventually blocks off the fallopian tubes. As with a tubal ligation, the woman's eggs are no longer able to reach the uterus, where they could possibly be fertilized by sperm. Tubal occlusion is more than 99% effective once successful blockage of the fallopian tubes is confirmed. It involves a 5 to 15 minute procedure that is performed in an outpatient setting under local anesthesia. Backup contraception must be used for three months, at which time an x-ray with contrast dye is used to ensure that both fallopian tubes are blocked off. Women must wait six weeks after a birth, miscarriage, or abortion to have a tubal occlusion. Possible complications with tubal occlusion include perforation of the uterus or fallopian tube and reactions to local anesthesia, which are extremely rare. Also, improper placement of the device may lead to an increased risk of ectopic or tubal pregnancy, which would require surgery. The most common complication is failure, where the tubes aren't occluded at the initial x-ray. If this happens, typically the x-ray is repeated in another three months. For most women, the tubes are usually found to be occluded by then. Vasectomy is a method of permanent contraception for men. It is an outpatient procedure that involves a small incision made in the scrotum after a local anesthetic is used. The provider then locates the vas deferens, which are the tubes that transport sperm from the testes to the penis. The tubes are then tied off and either cut or sealed preventing sperm from exiting the penis during ejaculation. The incision heals quickly without sutures. The no scalpel technique is considered the standard of care. Men are able to resume sexual activity about one week after the procedure or as soon as they are comfortable. Backup contraception must be used until a sperm analysis confirms that there are no sperm left in their semen. The sperm check should be done at least three months after the procedure and after at least 20 ejaculations. Failure rates, complication rates, and cost of procedure are lower for vasectomy than tubal ligation. Men may experience tenderness and bruising after a vasectomy. Complications are rare and include reactions to local anesthesia. Sperm can be stored in a sperm bank as a backup. You ask, what questions do you have? Marcus asks, if you get a vasectomy, can you still have an orgasm? And what happens to the sperm? I mean, you don't stop making them, do you? Where do they go if they can't get through anymore? You explain that a vasectomy doesn't change anything about a man's ability to ejaculate or experience pleasure during sex. After a vasectomy, the man's ejaculate contains only semen, or fluid, no sperm. The sperm are reabsorbed into the body. Looking relieved, Marcus says, Well, it seems pretty clear that a vasectomy is the way to go. Is that okay with you, Ash? Ashley responds, saying, Definitely. No surgery for me sounds good, as long as you're willing. You say that it sounds like they have a plan but that it may make sense to see how they both feel in a couple of days and to do some research on their own. You give them a list of evidence-based online resources about vasectomies and referrals to two local urologists who perform vasectomies who you know will be thorough in counseling and ensuring informed consent.